this angry crowd. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we've got a big crowd tonight. Uh, uh, we're returning to public session after having been in executive session uh, for a few minutes. I'm sorry to have been delayed and to cause everyone to wait. Um, please join me uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have a, um, an official function that we need to perform so that we can operate as a five-member board. Uh, we had an election in town, as uh, I'm sure most, if, if not everyone, knows. And uh, uh, Michael Stone and Tracy Post <laughs> are going to be sworn in this evening. So, Congratulations, guys, on your re-election. You. Please uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear, I swear that I will faithfully and impartially, that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties to which I have been elected and abide by the laws of the town of Yarmouth and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So help me God. So help me God. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to add my uh, public personal <coughs> congratulations to both of you for you, your Norm. elections and, and uh, very pleased that you're back on the board with our team. I think uh, we've made a, uh, a good effort in the last year and, and uh, functioned well as a board. Um, we're going to move uh, on to another um, uh, public item. I'd like to ask uh, Chief Fredrickson to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we're here tonight um, for a, a great moment uh, for the town of Yarmouth. We're going to promote Officer Diana Wells to the position of sergeant. It's significant in the fact that uh, since 1949, we have not had a female supervisor in the department. So that's a, that's a big deal for us, and I, I, I'm so happy. <laughs> However, you know, before you walk, you have to crawl. And before you run, you have to walk. In 1978, this woman right here next to me, Zara Kilmurray, was a groundbreaking police officer for the town of Yarmouth, the first female police officer in the town of Yarmouth. <laughs> Prior to being a full-time officer, she worked as a part-time officer for a few summers before that. Uh, she worked for 10 years as a full-time officer. She was a field training officer, a sexual assault investigator, a recipient of several awards uh, throughout her career. Uh, she's a graduate of Cape Cod Community College, Bridgewater State College. She has a bachelor's degree, and also a graduate of Boston Unity U University School of Law. She became an attorney. Uh, she also was uh, one of the directors of the criminal justice program over at Cape Cod Community College. And I just thought it was significant that we just step back in time so we know where, we've, where we were and where we are today. And having worked with Zara, being helped by Zara, I don't know that she ever really got the, uh, the right recognition at that time. But I just want to introduce Zara for tonight and thank you so much for what you did for us. So tonight, 
Zara will be part of our ceremony. But before we get to that, I want to tell you a bit about our, our new sergeant, Diana Wells. Born in Argentina. Married to police detective Michael Wells. Now, what's interesting is that uh, we hired Michael and Diana together, and they were already married. So we had no issues there, okay? Uh, she's a nine-year veteran of the Yarmouth Police Department. She's a certified sexual assault and investigator. She was a recipient of the Community Placing Award for her work with the Back to School uh, Shop with a Cop, Shop with a Cop at Christmas, Yarmouth Police Explorers, and the Mental Health Outreach Team. She also received recognition from the Massachusetts Association of Women in Law Enforcement. Um, she's a graduate of uh, James Robertson High School in Fairfax County, Virginia, a graduate of uh, University of Maryland with a bachelor's degree in criminology and criminal justice. She's a graduate from Suffolk University with a master's degree uh, in criminal justice, a graduate of the Municipal Police Training Committee uh, Academy at Plymouth, and her uh, promotion was effective May 20th. She is also fluent in uh, several languages, uh, so we're quite proud of the work and that she has done. And she is promoted because she earned it. Nothing to do with gender, nothing at all. Just that she made us proud, worked hard, did everything that was asked of her, went through the process, and it was, uh, was her turn. I also might add while we're here, as I am very proud of our other female officers here too. Uh, I think Officer Gibney is here, uh, and Officer Wenberg I think is working on the road right now. So thank you to you also. So <laughs> Sergeant Wells is here with her husband Michael and little boy Logan and Clara over there with the cute little uh, hairdo there. Zara, would you please present this to uh, Detective Wells over there? Uh, just to let you know, what uh, there's more work to be done for Dara to be a sergeant. Um, currently, she is attending uh, Women's Leadership Institute right now this week. Um, it is put on by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. We, the Yama Police, sponsored it. There are 50 female police leaders from across the world attending the class. Um, next week, she'll, re she'll get one week of training in sergeant school. And then in September, she'll receive two weeks of leadership training at Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. So there's never any rest for a sergeant. So it's not just something you get promoted and you sit there and do nothing. We have a high expectations of you, Diana, and we know you will come through. So thank you for your time tonight, and we appreciate it very much. Mr. Chairman and Chief, I don't know if I, if I might take the, a moment to, I see uh, Sergeant Fallon in the back, and I think it's appropriate that we take a moment to congratulate uh, Sergeant Fallon on his uh, long service to our community.
and um, his retirement. And his retirement is what paved the way and allowed um, <coughs> Sergeant Wells to take that position. But um, I've watched Sergeant Fallon speak many times in public, and he is um, an unbelievable speaker and a, a master negotiator. And so um, I think it, I'm sure that there'll be other people to step up to the plate, but um, I would like to just take a moment to thank you for your service. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to have uh, a, a great promotion and a beautiful family uh, 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 here tonight with us. So. Uh, um, <laughs> At this time, uh, we'll uh, recognize anyone else that would like to uh, come before the board this evening. Is there anyone else in the uh, audience? No? All right. Thank you very much. Seeing none, we'll move on. Yeah, we have some people. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Rosemary Marino. I'm in District 1. And I want you, to want you to know that being a resident of Yarmouth has lately been quite an embarrassment. People have recently, people that I've recently met immediately want to know from me what the heck is going on in Yarmouth. They are dumbfounded to have read that the governing body, that's you, sued another town entity, namely our school committee. Believe me, it's very hard for me to explain to someone else, just like because just like them, I thought that intelligent leaders of a town would find a way, short of going to court, to reach an agreement. Since, as far as we know of this moment, since no progress has been made in this regard, I wish you could tell me differently, we want you to know that concerned Yarmouth and Dennis seniors have created an organization called Dennis Yarmouth seniors for education. We want the two towns to know that our concern are the school children who deserve better. They deserve the $44 million the state has earmarked for the building of a new middle school, and they deserve the share for this expense that was approved during the election of December 8th. For you to declare after the fact that this election should not have taken place we find, uh, I find absolutely outrageous. I wonder if the majority of you had progressed in this way if you still had children in the school system. Sorry, I know you do have some, one, right? He's graduated, I, Eric oh. has children. I have okay, two. all right, I don't want to ac accuse anyone. Uh, we seniors also do not have kids in school anymore, but our concern goes beyond educating our own children. We want to support today's students so that they too have the educational advantages needed for their future. Therefore, please reconsider your actions and should the judge rule against you, please do not consider an appeal. Um, we, will not o we would not only lose the 44 million expected from the state, but will incur additional legal costs and costs for whatever we will do within, with, uh, with the schools. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, my name is Crystal Gibbs and I live in Precinct 2. I'm here to respectfully ask you if it's still appropriate to drop the suit against the school district and against the town of Dennis. If you had considered the school district's way of holding a vote to build a new middle school to not be within the law, and within the agreement between the districts, then the time to have taken some action would have been immediately after the announcement of the election. To file a suit after the vote was conducted is specious at best. To wait until it became apparent that the majority of the citizens of Yarmouth did not mirror the vote of the majority of citizens of Yarmouth did not mirror the majority vote of the school district citizens and voters makes the board look like crybabies to be simple about it or I might suggest it's like suing your spouse and then expecting to have pleasant din dinner, night, dinner conversation every night. Such action by the leadership of the town diminishes the credibility of the entire town to say nothing about harming the educational options for the, the youth of this community. 
So again, I urge you to drop the suit. Thank you. My name is Don Marino. Uh, I'm in District 1. Uh, I, along with my wife, attended the court hearing on the suit between Dennis and Yarmouth. For the life of me, and I listened very carefully. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't judge the legal merits, but I listened very carefully to the uh, arguments on both sides, and I believe that uh, Dennis had the much stronger argument. In fact, I couldn't really gather what Yarmouth was all about. Your, I'd like to know why we're spending taxpayers' money on this legal suit. I'd like to know what the overall plan of action is. Why are we suing them? And if we, even if we win, what are we going to do with the suit? How is this going to impact our taxes down the road? I haven't seen a clear denunciation of if we lose the $44 million, who's going to pay to repair the schools? Now, I've done some homework since the, the court, and the schools are in terrible condition, and have been for a number of years. I've talked to a number of people that have worked on committees for the last 10 years looking to repair our schools. So fixing up the schools or replacing them is not a new issue in this town. It's an old issue. And it's coming. And somebody's going to have to pay for it. Who's going to pay for it? Do you want the seniors to pay for it? The state, I think, sees the impossibility of having two different districts repair the schools, so they've offered $44 million in a joint project, which is a sensible thing to do. I think that's sensible from an economic standpoint. It's sensible from a tax standpoint. I think it will benefit both the Dennis as well as the Yarmouth people, and we should get along with it. And again, I, along with my wife and the others, I really urge you to drop the suit and move on and get this thing accomplished. The time is running out uh, to get the $44 million. I'm Lois Grebe and also in District 1. In some ways, this is January 4th to you, not Janu uh, June 4th, because it's sort of like a new year with your new structure of your um, board. Even though it's the same people, you're still, it's still a new time for you. And with New Year's, usually we contemplate what we've done in the past, what we hope to do in the future, what we can change or what we could uh, learn from past mistakes. <clears throat> and um, it's pretty apparent that the lawsuit is a gigantic mistake. <clears throat> and I was very um, enlightened at the town meeting, at the very end of the town meeting, this last town meeting, the last item on the agenda was a bill to, uh, article to pass um, plastic water bottles, single water bottle use. And it gave me a good idea of how your group thinking is because you unanimously rejected it. Now the warrant could have been more specific, it could have been broader, but your reasoning came down to two things unanimously. One was that, eh, Yarmouth is just a small place. We can't do too much. You know, why try? And the second one was that everybody, each individual person, will have his own decision to make. Now, I would consider that a lack of leadership not to understand the, the important dynamic of that warrant and to throw it off to, eh, we're too small, everybody can make his own decision, and you did that unanimously, shows me that the real problem here is your vision. You think small, you think negatively, and I hope in this coming year You'll be able to broaden your, ass, your ideas and your vision. You'll listen to more viewpoints. You'll think more inclusively rather than myopically. And, and I hope, I hope very much that you will make decisions this coming new year that will make us proud to be citizens of Yarmouth. Happy New Year.
uh, Vita Morris. Uh, I don't think I could have a better endorsement uh, than these comments for making sure that in the future when we have controversial uh, issues coming up, that there will be a, a mailing sent to all the voters explaining what is coming up and, and uh, uh, giving the pros and cons and not try to hide behind, oh no, we can't do that because you know we're not supposed to be doing it. Uh, I can't think of a better reason. Now the way a lot of these people spoke, uh, you would have thought that the $44 million uh, was going to build the schools, the school. Uh, I trust that they realize that uh, uh, there's another $73 million to be covered by the two towns, of which Yarmouth would be responsible for $50 million without uh, the financing charges, which then brings it up to about $100 million over the uh, uh, term of the bond. So uh, uh, anyway, what I wanted to talk about a little bit was about last night's uh, school committee meeting I thought I was in a parallel pal uh, universe there because they're talking uh, about, I, I think they, what they need to do is go revisit the uh, budget and redo the assessments. And there was nothing like that. They, they gave some slides uh, with different figures. There was no indication what the process was going to be, what they were going to do. Uh, they just uh, re-voted again for the second time, I think, to ask for a two-week uh, extension. Um, uh, from the uh, uh, state, you know, to uh, consider this, but I, I don't think that the uh, superintendent is at all inclined to uh, uh, re start from square one, which she has to do. Since one town voted one way, according to the new or the revised agreement, the other one voted uh, something that they brought up on their own, uh, which they're not supposed to do, apparently, according to the law. They can only vote on the assessment that's been presented to them by the school committee and voted on by the school committee uh, and voted up or down. But then they stuck in another article in there. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, I wish uh, you, uh, somebody uh, from this board would start looking into uh, what's going on over there. Now, Brian Carey did suggest to the superintendent that maybe she needs to get uh, the uh, uh, people from the two towns on board, in other words, from the select boards, I guess, you know, primarily maybe the finance committees uh, into this whole process. I don't know what, what she's doing and where the budget is right now after last night. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Jim Cullen from Precinct One. Quality public education should be the number one priority for any community. It is as vital as roads, security, water, and business. For many years, professionals and community volunteers have studied facility needs in the DY school district. Last year, a recommendation for a new middle school was put forth. This included state support of $44 million as part of the financing package. I do think we understand that the project is over $100 million. Unfortunately, since that time, the Yarmouth Select Board has compromised this project by using it to leverage negotiations for a revised school agreement. And I think you're all aware that hasn't had too much success. What is best for students, parents, alumni, and our community has not been the priority. So what did Yarmouth leaders do to show their commitment to the educational partnership of Yarmouth, Dennis, and the school committee? It sued our partners, putting this critical school project and state financing in jeopardy. What can you do now? Please drop the lawsuit. Don't wait for a judge's ruling. Do it now and let the middle school project go forward. We could also restart the negotiations on a revised agreement, although I would suggest you maybe need some new players to do that who are perhaps not as biased towards one answer or another. Perhaps you could seek a mediator's help. Build bridges, not walls. It does no good to blame Dennis and to throw this back in Dennis's lap. We must work together. A standalone school system is not a good idea. It is very costly, non-productive, and not in the best interest of this town. Let us more constructively move forward with our partners. Thank you.
Yes, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Nepic. My name is Don Costa. I am a resident of West Yarmouth, Precinct 5. And I'm here this evening representing AMBETS Post 333. Uh, I did send an email out to Selectman. We, what we were planning, and if I may, uh, Mr. Nepic, pass these uh, out each. This one for each person. There's a name on the stone up front, Ori M. D. Sampson, Corporal United States Army, Ori Sampson <coughs> Jr., who served in Korea. And uh, as you read the uh, things I sent out, there's a lot to do with this uh, young man that went to Korea. Uh, what we were talking about, my friend Joyce and I, Joyce is a, also a member of the AMVET. She was gonna be here this evening. She's working with Cape Cod veterans regarding uh, Flag Day service, so she's unable to be here. I wish she was to take some of the heat off, by the way. But anyway, we, we were the forerunners of, we wanted to do something for Ori Sampson. If you read the, if you can read the article very much so, they do think that he grew up in Yarmouth, town of Yarmouth, in uh, Yarmouth Port, uh, the, in the old family homestead, which is still there. His sister, uh, Shirley, still lives there, and we had an occasion to visit with her and uh, talk to her about her brother, Ori, and it's, uh, it's uh, quite evident that the Sampson family was very uh, patriotic. They had many members, uncles and aunts, not aunts, uncles, grandfather, who served in the military. And Ori evidently took up the, uh, after his ancestors and enlisted in the service at the beginning of the Korean War, only to know that he would end up there. But so anyway, what we had thought about doing, and we can't, uh, obviously can't do it now, but we had thought about maybe possibly some sort of memorial for him. We were looking at the, uh, the I call it the bike trail bridge on Station Arrow, it would be a perfect spot to have uh, dedicate that bridge in his name. But as I found out today, uh, Mr. Napick's uh, secretary, Linda, sent me an email, and I had this kind of thought anyway, that that property uh, doesn't belong to the town, it belongs to the state. So now we open up another can of worms to me, anytime the state gets their fingers involved in something, it creates a, so uh, what we're gonna do, and uh, Mr. Napick suggested what you thought, oh, I will touch base with uh, Representative Tim Whalen and sort of take it from there. But if you read the story about uh, uh, Corporal Sampson, the night that he, he went missing, uh, it's on the second page of chapter. I would read it, but I mean, if I go somewhere, I always forget something, I forgot my reading glasses, but I'll do the best I can to, to see what kind of person he was. He, he was assigned to uh, Alpha Company of the 31st Infantry, 7th, uh, Scott, I'm sorry, I can't read this very well. But anyway, he, his uh, Alpha Company was up on a hill in Korea, it's called uh, Jane Russell Hill. Now the, the GIs named all these hills in Korea pork chop because of the terrains and stuff, and one only can imagine what they named this hill, Jane Russell, I believe. She's before my time, uh, sorta. I believe she was a movie actress or something. But uh, the company, Alpha Company, was overrun by the Chinese. Uh, ammunition ran low. Uh, combat ended up in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the trenches. And that's the night that Ori Simpson, he was never, never considered a POW, never, never presumed to be killed in action. He was lost. And uh, that's the, about the story who Ori Simpson is. You'll see his name out on the, uh, stone out front, and if we can do something with the help of the town, uh, it, uh, sort of some of the logistic items, we don't need any money for signs where the veterans organizations will cover that, if this should come to be. The only thing that we would like, if it should ever come to fruition, so to speak, is to have a dedication ceremony at the bridge, and have the fire department down there with the tower and the flag and stuff. If this shit ever comes to be, we, this is the reason uh, I am here this evening and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. If there's any questions, uh, please, about what we have in mind, but okay. All right, well, now then we'll try to coordinate with Tim Whalen and uh, yes, uh, help Thank you, you as much you. Thank as you we can. Thank you very much. Well, All right, thank you. For th there's, there are certain parcels of, of Yarmouth that are within our rights to right. name and there's a process for naming that he could uh, undertake if 
it was an appropriate place that we wouldn't need uh, we don't need state legislation to to name town of Yarmouth property that's that's our our right <coughs> Good evening, I'm Ann Gregoire from Precinct 1. I just have a quick question or clarification. I thought Mr. Marino had some terrific questions and I'm wondering, is it um, part of the process to answer his questions or are we just, di are we just dismissed without getting answers to his questions? I don't think we're going to go into a long discussion of that this evening. We've had um, uh, a lot of public discussion uh, Going back a number of months, we had uh, uh, three or four dedicated meetings of the select board with public input and questions with regard to uh, the proposals for the new school. And uh, we discussed the town's position, uh, this board's position at length in those uh, uh, meetings. And um, I appreciate and understand uh, the, the viewpoints that have been expressed tonight. Um, but in fact, uh, you know, we, uh, I think, represent and have tried to represent the 57% of the Yarmouth voters that uh, did not want uh, to approve the school and wanted a new regional agreement. And there are a lot of good reasons for the, that vote. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things, that, uh, I'm gonna go step back a second in terms of uh, um, why <coughs> it's so difficult for a two-town district to operate. But one of the things that uh, could happen in a district is that uh, if, if the process that the school followed is allowed to continue, is that the small town would constantly be at the, at the uh, mercy of a much larger town in that district by, and not be entitled to, to uh, say no to a project at any time. And, and that's a significant argument uh, uh, for a different process than what the, the um, uh, school, uh, the regional district uh, put our two towns through. Um, but beyond that, uh, the, the regional agreement uh, is so outdated and so burdensome to our town, to the town of Yarmouth, that we expressed our misgivings, our objection to continuing the, uh, uh, the process of uh, putting together a proposal for a new school without first attending to the regional agreement. The way the regional agreement is structured, uh, there are no, uh, there's no um, allowance for negotiations. One town, and in this case, Dennis, can simply say, that's the agreement, that's the way it is. There's no requirement in the agreement. It was constructed 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, and then amended sometimes, but in any case, there's no requirement that if one town uh, feels strongly about uh, the, pr the uh, provisions of the agreement and problems with those provisions, there's no requirement <coughs> that the two towns come together in a mediation process or uh, 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 come together in any kind of a negotiation process. One of the towns can simply say, we don't want to talk. And it's as simple as that. The agreement does not provide for that. Uh, so that's a significant and important uh, issue with regard to the uh, regional agreement. Um, there are other provisions that are uh, likewise substantially uh, a problem. Uh, there are the provision with regard to bonding and with regard to the assumption of debt in the regional agreement allows for the uh, redetermination annually of the share of the bonding over uh, based upon student population. So that put our town at, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, at a, a significant disadvantage in that forecasting into the future, we could look at uh, the population shift uh, between Dennis and Yarmouth uh, <coughs> causing our community to absorb 
perhaps five to ten million dollars of additional burden under the the uh, terms of the agreement. Uh, that did not uh, sit well with our board, and and we believed that the uh, uh, town taxpayers would not uh, um, would would be unfairly treated as a result of that. There are many other provisions of the agreement that are that are uh, real problems, and we spent um, starting eight years ago. A lot of time trying to get to the uh, uh, the table to uh, negotiate new provisions of the agreement, um, and I I won't air all the dirty laundry from the, from those time periods, uh, but we we called this board called for renegotiation uh, many many times over that eight year period, and our efforts were rejected. And uh, you know the the issues are significant. The um, uh, that's not to place blame on Dennis. Uh, the the trends in in the trends in um, you might be polite. I'm trying to uh, explain something that I think is very serious. I'm, I'm, and 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 we've given you that opportunity. Um, so, lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Uh, the what I was going to say talk about is the the trends in the student population over the last number of years. Um, since 1993, when uh, Dennis's population was 42 percent of the total. Uh, student population uh, that has gone down to now about 30 percent. That's had a significant um, financial impact uh, on the DY district and on the sharing of costs. Um, and uh, we had uh, tried to negotiate with Dennis on that I on that point, and. Uh, and, and we felt very, very strongly that there should be a, a different sharing agreement than the one that existed, which was student population on October 1st. There were other problems with, with that uh, way of, of sharing costs. What it resulted uh, in is that Yarmouth was paying at least a quarter of a million dollars annually effectively to send Dennis students to schools out of district. And it took eight years for them to finally say, okay, we'll agree to use foundation enrollment because that's the, that is the enrollment number that includes out of district students. And, uh, uh, you know, so, <sighs> You know, there have been an awful lot of issues, and it's, it's um, I don't think it's fair to say that this board does not support education. I think our board has, in fact, supported education and has supported overrides for the school district. Um, and uh, uh, have we always been happy about that? No. But I think that we've been uh, uh, very supportive over, the, over uh, the last number of years while still trying to renegotiate uh, significant issues with the current agreement. And I, and I think it's very unfair to paint this board as, as uh, uh, unsupportive of education. I don't know if there's any other board members that would like to add anything at this point. Um, but uh, th those are explanations. We need to get on with our agenda this evening. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure that we were getting a rebuttal or our questions answered before okay. we all leave the room. I didn't okay. want it to be dismissed. So right. thank you for that. Thank you. All right, we're going to go on with our uh, regular agenda. The, uh, you, you, you took as much time <coughs> as all of us did. Can't we follow up? We're never given an opportunity. 
wrong. Yeah. Chris, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Christine Greeley, I'm, ch I'm here tonight on behalf of the Yarmouth Suf Substance Awareness Committee, YSAC, to formally present the No Alcohol Until 21 Pledge Week event funded by the Federal Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. Three years ago, we sponsored the Think Before the Drink Forum, funded by them and, at and attended by well over 100. We were invited to sponsor another forum this year but things have changed, and attendance at even professionally advertised and developed forums recently have dropped so significantly, we decided to design a social media forum instead. Concurrently, Jamie Biende of the Alcohol Beverage Control, Control Commission, also known as ABCC, had established a working group called the Cape Cod Alcohol Coalition to address underage drinking and to write a parent's pledge. And Barnstable County recently awarded us a grant to co-host a graduation week substance-free party for DUI class of 2019 this Friday night. So here we are tonight celebrating Pledge Week with a special viewing of the PSAs developed as part of the forum. Nick Pascarinosa, the school resource officer, helped to write and stage them with assistance from Pat McCaffrey, while Reed Winham, at the DY High School, filmed and produced them. Our police chief, Fredrickson, along with Dennis Chief DiMatteo, star in a strong message to the community about social hosting, while some great DY parents star in the first public presentation of the Parents' Pledge on Cape Cod. The entire project was developed by subcommittee members Annie Catalano from the police department, Chris McMahon, McMahon, McCannon, I guess, from the fire department, Paul Funk from the high school, and Nick and Pat and myself, all of us also working on the PR and distribution necessary for this. Deputy uh, Steve Xaros helped with the posting on town public safety sites, and Bruce Barrow of our town IT department helped with posting on town hall sites. And Chris Twelly tonight worked on getting them set for viewing tonight. So special thanks are owed also to Peter Zwiderski of Sinorama on White's Path for the donating the lawn signs around town. It was a significant contribution. To the Chamber of Commerce, we you see also their sign, and to all of our liquor stores in Yarmouth because they're distributing the pledge flyers to customers this week on our behalf. Also, I received in the last few hours contact from people telling me that the Facebook pages of the DY parents and even of Representative Will Crocker now contain the Yarmouth Pledge Week and no alcohol until 21. So Yarmouth, let's pledge to no alcohol until 21. Chief Frank Fredrickson, and I'm Dennis Police Chief Peter DiMatteo. We're here together to set the stage for the high school to record the message for the parents. The Massachusetts Social Host Law provides for serious criminal penalties for hosting underage drinking parties, and you may be subject to civil lawsuits from other parents. Adults and minors can be subject to a $2,000 fine and up to one year in jail. We want you to know that we will vigorously prosecute offenders of the social host law. At prom time, graduation, someone's birthday, or any random Friday night, you should know that we are committed to the safety of your children, and we need you to be too. Don't be a cool parent. Be a good parent. Help us out and keep your reputation, keep your freedom, keep your home. Don't host underage drinking parties. It gets better. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan J.T. Thompson. I'm Brian Moscato. I'm Jamie Carter. I'm Mary Beth Karras. I'm Stacy Ferreira. And we are all parents of Dennis Yarmouth students. We have a very important message for you about the Massachusetts Social Host Law. If you have a guest in your home who is under 21, it is illegal for you to give them alcohol. It's even illegal for you to allow them to drink alcohol in your house, whether you provide it or not. We've all heard parents say, I would rather have them drink at home. 
Well, you can't do that with other people's children. This means that you don't have any right to allow other people's kids to drink alcohol at your party. The penalties can be pretty harsh, so if you're thinking about doing this, don't. People who host underage drinking parties can be charged with a crime, can be sued by other parents, or both. Civil judgments can be in excess of $2 million. You could lose your house. Be a good parent. Actively supervise all activities and parties in your home on property you control. Do not allow the possession or use of alcohol or other drugs by youths in your home. Don't permit anyone who appears to be under the influence to drive. And if they are underage, contact their parents. Set expectations for your own child by knowing where they are going, who they are with, what their plans are, and when they will come home. Communicate with other parents and welcome calls from them if their children have been invited to your home. Don't take a foolish risk to be cool for your kids. The cost could be much higher than you think. Let's work together to create safe celebrations for every occasion for all of our children. Don't be a cool parent. Be a good parent. Don't host underage drinking parties. Obviously, very excited about this work um, and the leadership of various people, including Chief Fredrickson, who gave us the don't be a cool parent, be a good parent. Uh, we really like that comment. And I will point out that on the back chair by the other agendas, we have copies of the uh, parents' pledge that are available for people in the public. And I do, as I said, uh, we will be co-sponsoring the uh, last night Lua, Friday night for DY students uh, with uh, DJ and lots of food and fun, all substance free. And then next Wednesday night at 6 p.m. on the 12th at Cape Cod Tech, there will be a family dinner party. It's a barbecue with the make your own ice cream sundaes. And we will be, and we're inviting parents and kids um, from grade seven to 11 in particular to come and we're gonna talk about vaping and marijuana, which is also the other big issue. So we, I thank you for your time. I also, as I say, go forward in the community. Let's make this a no alcohol under 21 pledge and a community really committed to this because we're providing leadership on the Cape now by doing this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go on to uh, our next item on the agenda, the Board of Selectmen reorganization. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the uh, chair position. Make a motion that we nominate Mike Stone for chairman. Second. Okay, and are there any other nominations? Those in favor, please a say discussion, aye. Mr. Uh, discussion, discussion, Mr. Discussion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, had had a, I had had a conversation with Mike uh, a couple weeks ago about uh, whether, you know, about the fact that he was next in line to be chairman and whether or not it was his intent to stay on as licensing chairman. Um, Mike, you didn't really give me an answer at that time. It, um, so I was just curious if it was still your intent to, if you were to become chairman, if you were to want to stay on as licensing chairman? <clears throat> I think both decisions are up to the board. Um, I, I, unlike you, Eric, I don't really see a problem with being uh, a chairman and a licensing chairman any more than I do with being a chairman and somebody being a liaison to the schools or a appointments chairman or some other committee or subcommittee type function. Um, I, I really don't have a, a good understanding of where you think the problem might lie. If it's time, um, you know, that would be up to me to, I guess, determine whether or not my schedule can handle that. Um, I think one of the reasons it could is because of my expertise in the area, and I, and I say that in quotation marks. I'm not an expert, but in terms of, I'm not a layman either. I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I understand laws, I've been doing this for six years, I've been working closely with Phil Magnuson, and uh, so I don't think it would take me anywhere near the amount of time it might take somebody else to do it. Um, if I were doing it from scratch and I didn't have that background, I'd probably be concerned about doing both. Um, but but maybe you can let me know more specifically what 
what my, your concern would be. My concern is is not your time. I can assure you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I feel better. Um, you know, my my concern is a division of power. Um, not since my time on this board has a chairman held licensing chairman or appointments chairman, um, because all three of those are very important positions, not to diminish the importance of the other positions, but all three are, are probably the top three positions. No two have been held by a single person in the 10 years that I've been on this board, and I don't know that they have ever been. So uh, my concern is from a division of power, standpoint uh, and as I said to you um, uh, if you want to be chairman I would I would fully support that but I think that uh, you are very valuable and knowledgeable as our licensing chairman but I um, for reasons other than the than what I've already stated um, I don't know that I'd be able to support you for both can I, I just want to make a comment on that I because I think this past year showed us a little bit about the process that we've taken. We've had a few more issues. And one of the things that we did delegate was to the licensing chair um, to have that discussion with the chairman on whether or not it comes before the full board. So now where we had two people making that decision really, um, it's it would be limited to one. Having said that, I, I, I think everybody deserves their chance as an elected person to serve as chairman. I think we've made a commitment to try to rotate the position. Um, but um, I think having somebody else do the licensing probably would be a good idea. And not to say that you wouldn't um, be uh, used in terms of your expertise, but um, I, I, I guess unless we're gonna change our policy that it's reviewed with somebody other than yourself making that. I, I just feel like one person making that decision might be uh, a little bit complicated. I don't think the decision making process now involves me and the chairman. As a licensing chairman, um, I, I make a decision and then the only decisions that I make that aren't really reviewed by the board and it's up to the petitioner would be if somebody was an unsuitable manager I think that's happened twice where we had somebody that was basically intoxicated while he was supposed to be working and another person that was doing drugs out in the parking lot. Um, they have a right of appeal to the full board. It's not like I say whether they come to the board or not. I make a decision and if they don't like it, then they come before the full board. The other thing is there, there's very minor matters. Uh, most everything comes before the full board. There was a case where um, this year somebody wasn't TIP certified. They shut down the business. They, uh, they did the online training. They opened their business. Uh, Phil recommended that you know we didn't take any action because they corrected the problem. Those kinds of things, like this common sense, why do we want to have a a full hearing over something like that. But anything of a serious nature, I refer to the full board. But whatever you decide, it's up to you. Okay. <clears throat> well, our first discussion or decision is with regard to the chair position. So we have a motion and a second. Do you accept that nomination, Mike? Yes. All right, uh, uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Mike, congratulations. I, I won't change chair chairs with you, but I will hand you the gavel. I don't need the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'd like to say a word. I'd like to, to, to thank the board. Uh, uh, I en enjoyed the uh, chairmanship in the last year. Hope I've served the uh, board well and hope that I've continued to serve the community well. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Norm. I appreciate the uh, service. I'd like to uh, nominate Mark for vice chairman. Second. You want me to start tonight? <laughs> oh. <laughs> You've got the chair. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Do you say accept, Mark? Yes. Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right.
Next, next position is clerk. Do we have any nominations for that position? Current clerk is Eric. I nominate Eric. Second. Eric, do you accept the nomination? Sure. Okay, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, anyone opposed? Next nomination is for chairman for licensing. Does anyone have any nominations? Did you want to do it, Eric? I mean, I think, I think like the chairman, I think it's good to have multiple um, people have experience at it. I, I know you have a, as a lawyer, you have a serious expertise in it, but uh, I'm not opposed to, to changing it if, the, if that's what the board wants to do, but I don't know if you had an interest. Honestly, I have the Affordable Housing Trust, the DPW Building think, Committee. Maybe. And the, well, we'll see. I at least have two <laughs> building committees that aren't on this list. So, um, What about Norm? Would you be interested in that? I'm not interested. No. Just not interested in the position. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you may get your wish. What? I mean, you, you may have to support him. I don't have to. There's yeah. four people that can vote. Mark? Oh, I'm not a candidate. Well, we don't have a choice then. <laughs> All right, I nominate uh, Mike Stone for uh, chair of the licensing board. I'll second. Further discussion? You're not the chairman anymore. Oh. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you know, well, it, does, it does. You know, so <laughs> I incorporate Norm's remarks by reference. <laughs> sorry, um, that may that's okay. Again, I'm no, sorry. I'm sure <laughs> it's going to happen more than once. Um, I always thought that you would chair out this meeting, but um, I'll do whatever you want. Okay, so we have a, a, a nomination in a second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Abstain. Okay, one abstention, three. No, I'm abstaining, two. Two abstentions, three in favor. Appointments, Chairman. Do we have any nomination? Mark, you, you want to do that again? I'm, I'm willing to take that on again. Okay. Do you have any other nominations? I'm nominating Mark. I'll second Mark. Okay, nomination second. Seeing no other nominations, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So Mark, unanimous. Ambulance waiver um, administration administrator. Um, I'll nominate Mark for that. I'll take that on. <laughs> second. second. All right. Any other nominations? All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. All right, Tracy, will you um, be willing to continue to be the liaison to the DY um, school committee? I'm willing to, unless somebody else wants to take their chance. Okay, I'll nominate Tracy for that. <laughs> Second. Second. I'm not sure how effective I've been. I have a nomination, two seconds. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, so Tracy's unanimous on that. DY contract negotiations team. Says Norm. Norm. Is this our year? Do we know if this is? Oh yeah, we're in the middle of it. Yeah, we're still in the cycle. Have you been yeah. participating, Norm? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, of late, they haven't had any meetings that were of any significance in terms of uh, uh, increases in rates and so forth. They've had some administrative things, but. You want to continue on that? I'll be happy to continue. I'll nominate Norm. Second. Okay. Any other nominations? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that's unanimous. Scholarship committee alternate. You willing to do that, Tracy? I would love to. It's my favorite thing to do. Okay. So I'll nominate <laughs> Tracy it. for that. Any seconds? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And they'll be here next week. That's unanimous. Or at our next meeting, I should say. Affordable Housing Trust. Eric, are you willing to continue? Yes. Okay, I'll nominate Eric for that. Second. All right, any other nominations? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So that's unanimous. What is the airport rep entail, Mike? You've got a lot on your that's plate. That's a good question. Uh, I, I haven't been doing much of that. I've been leaving it up to Bill Morasco, who's the actual representative, um, primarily because of all the executive sessions we had both with respect to um, Lewis Bay and the school issues. 
Um, they meet at four o'clock on Tuesdays. Oh, okay. Um, and so So I, does he notify you when he's unable to attend? No. <laughs> I, I haven't really talked to him in a while. So if anyone else wants to do it, but it, again, it's, it's one of those things where if we have executive sessions, it's very hard to attend these things on a, on a Tuesday. Yeah. I'll do it just because, I, I mean, if the board wants me to, because I just think you've got okay. too much. Unless so I'll nominate else, Tracy for that. Unless somebody else has an interest. That's fine. Second. I've done it before. You want to do it? No. Oh. <laughs> All right, we have a... Um, an, um, a nomination and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that's Tracy. All right, we're done. You're just beginning. We're done with that. <laughs> okay, next item 645 Special Indemnity Fund Policy Review and Approval. Who's going to do that? I'll turn this over to Chris. He's been working on this since uh, we conceived this idea, just a, as a broad overview of this. We had researched um, insurance policy type to reimburse the town for the losses that in, are incurred by, in police and fire when there's an injury on duty. As you know, when injury on duty occurs, we assume full pay. Uh, it doesn't get moved to a workers' comp vehicle like other town employees. So somebody gets full pay. And when they're out, unable to work, we backfill those positions typically because our staffing is uh, pretty slim to begin with on overtime. Uh, so one of the things that constant themes that you hear is um, pressure on overtime uh, and what can we do about it? Well, one of the things by analyzing the LOD claims, we did find out that uh, over the years, there's been a few claims that have been out there uh, very large in the number of days duration, in fact, uh, sometimes in the event of uh, over a year's time. So we looked at uh, some analysis on this. Chris put some work together on this, and we came up with almost essentially a self-insurance fund. Uh, so we put the article in front of town meeting uh, this year uh, to initially seed it with $225,000. The idea would be that in extraordinary circumstances of extended leave, um, to help alleviate uh, pressure on the operating budget overtime accounts, this account could be asked of uh, to uh, backfill either police or fire by um, their normal standard budgetary transfer process, which is we present it to finance committee. They vote on it. If they approve it, we advance it to the board chairman. I, I have some questions, Mr. Chairman. Sure, go ahead, Tracy. Um, I guess my vision of what this might have been is a little bit different than what I see here. You, um, you took an average, and just so the public understands uh, at home, the policy says for for the fire department, it's 192 days. So basically, it wouldn't be until after that average that this would kick in. And the police department has 523 days. So I'm not really sure how this is going to help them. Um, really because what we're trying to do is get that the full line of duty really out of their um, overtime budget and and I know that we don't have the money for that now and I understand with 250,000 what we're doing here but I would like to try to work towards um, having this fund for all line of duty so that way when somebody's out and you know it's backfilled on overtime that doesn't penalize against their budget well we do accommodate so, a certain amount of overtime every year for uh, regular and routine circumstances and I guess part of this is a pilot program if you will we, we've appropriated X dollar value against that overtime account same dollar value over the years there was a minor reduction in that recently with um, the fire department grant because we mm -hmm. transferred some of that money into the full-time salary account but the issue here is really for those extraordinary circumstances when somebody's out on extended leave, we're unable to handle this. What we didn't want to do is leave anybody with the impression, you know, one of the most aggressive ways to manage an injury is to uh, manage the case such that somebody is constantly kept in contact and tries to get back to work. And we do know that um, that is a successful part of getting somebody to return. And in the past, a number of cases that, have, that the town has... Um, Hey, now we probably haven't case managed it as aggressively as we need it to be. So this is in those circumstances we believe, like right now we are in a, knock on wood, a very healthy LOD situation right now. I think the fire department may have two 
but may go up by an extra one. That's kind of a historic low. Police right now is uh, in, in good shape, very historic low. But so this would be one of those scenarios that um, if we had a year like we did about this time last year, we had a lot of injuries on the job, this, this budget uh, item could backfill some of those overtime accounts. So we didn't really want to reward or get the idea of, well, if somebody goes out on an injury, we're just going to tap the account. I think it's important for administration to explain to the finance committee in the board what we've done to manage the case before we asked you for some extra time. I'm not saying that we shouldn't manage the case to get the people back to work. I absolutely agree that that, that needs to continue to happen. I would just like to see us work towards reducing these numbers so that way when somebody's out on a line of duty, if it's a legit line of duty, the budget isn't penalized by that because there's no way for them to plan for that. And our goal is to help them, but 523 hours to me is a lot of time before, um, you know, before this kicks in. So in, in, in the too. paragraph under miscellaneous, though, Dan, if I could for just one moment, it talks about um, that it's presumed that there's still going to be adequate funding within um, the budgets of both police and fire to take care of these 111F benefits. This is just going to be a backfill in some kind of extraordinary cases. Many cases that, well, this is like in the, in the these are extreme outliers. You know, 25% of the case load would be these type of ideas. So these people are out on extended leave, puts a lot of duress on the budget. The vast majority of leave cases, clearly over the analysis, has indicated that people get back to work in a fashion in which we can accommodate it. Actually, probably in many instances, by the time we went out on LOD and we got uh, you know an identification as to what the issue is and we got a transfer in the works and going through maybe the person comes back to work by that time so there is a there is a provision to to select and post point that if something falls short of the 75th percentile case we can go to the finance committee and ask them so if we know somebody falls just underneath that time duration and and we know it, it, it. You know we're still managing the case. It's under, but they're clearly not going to come back in that time frame. We could certainly go to the finance committee uh, and, and present that case to them, and then come to the chairman. I mean, it, ultimately, it's a policy for your deliberation. If you wanted to amend it somehow, um, it, it, it was intended to provide a, a relief valve. No question. I'm with you 100 percent. I just don't know how far, I mean, do we know what we spent in overtime for LODs just last year alone? Oh, we have all those numbers. It would exhaust, if you were to do that, it would exhaust the full free cash amount that was allocated at the town meeting. So if you were to go that route, you know, I'd suggest planning to allocate at least that amount every yeah. year. For well, that's what I'm thinking. I, I understand why we did this. <clears throat> But I think that just I'm just having a conversation that I think we should try to work towards trying to put the money in that actually covers it. That's just my opinion. Mr. Chairman. Sure. No, I think this is a, a, a smart move. I support the policy. I don't necessarily <laughs> see any need to change it, but from a management point of view, uh, it's very important. So I totally endorse this. Norm, do you have anything on this? No, I, you know, I, I, I guess I look at it as, uh, you know, a kind of an experiment in order to uh, try to get a better uh, handle on uh, line of duty injury costs. Uh, and, um, you know, if, I, I think if this is one avenue to do that, I think that's fine. Uh, but I'm not... To Tracy's point, I'm not sure it's the, the final solution. I mean, there's, there's, there's other things that need to be done, but, but I think in, if this provides some assistance, um, then I think that's fine. Mr. Chair, if I might, that, sure. that's a good point. One of the keys to remedying like what that final solution might look, at, look like is to analyze what is the, if there's any like systemic cause related to your injuries. And I'll give you a good example because it's paid great dividends. So in the fire department, we had a significant number of injuries that occurred to the neck and upper back location, the paramedic service, lifting patients. Yeah. And we had a tremendous amount. Some of these cases went to surgery, which is very costly. Um, and in some cases, the time out of the job was extensive. So the chief and his staff identified that, mo that uh, striker 
um, type of stretcher device. And since that has been, you know, the town and you authorize the purchase of these so all the ambulances get outfitted. Since we've gone down that road, coupled with staff training on that particular issue, we have not, and I, and I hate to talk like this, but I mean, just because I'm a little bit superstitious, but we, it has worked incredibly successful such that we haven't had those injuries. So in any time somebody goes out, we do look at that. Now I will tell you that we are watching, you know, it's of concern to us um, that uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome has not historically been an LOD related issue. It is starting to creep into um, the diagnosis that we're seeing. Um, and if that's the case and it goes the trending as a other type of what I would call more obvious uh, on, the do on the job injuries, um, then we're going to have a significant challenge on our hands, no question about that as it relates to paying for this. Um, but to date, on cases that uh, we've been able to identify effective remedies for the staff, it's been it's been working quite well. Okay. Eric, do you have anything on this? I don't. Okay. Make a motion that we approve uh, the special injury indemnity fund procedure, and with that, I'd like to actually uh, check in on it in a year's time. Yeah, I, I was going to, um, Tracy, pick up on that point too, and, and that is if this, we don't, if we find portions of this problematic, we can revisit it down the road. And certainly, I think it's prudent to take a look at it a year from now and see how it's working and whether it's um, meeting the objectives that we're trying to accomplish here. All right, so we have a motion by Tracy. I'll with, second it. And a second by Mark. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, I think Mark is next. Yep. Well, I have two items. Committee appointments. Mr. Chairman, two resignations. Um, one is to accept the resignation, Anastasia Ellis from the library board to accept So moved with thanks. Uh, and a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. And the other resignation is Lisa Cody. She is stepping down from the Water Resources Advisory Committee. And um, so to accept that resignation. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 carries. That is uh, the conclusion of my report. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, next item is approval of minutes for October 25th, 2018, October 30, 2018, and November 23rd, 2018. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Anyone opposed? So those are approved unanimously. Upcoming agenda review is next. Uh, right. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. Uh, we, I, um, I'm hoping to get in front of you for consideration as a, a, a review on the beach sticker policy related to military service. Um, we've had an interaction uh, with a constituent relative to being recognized as a military service personnel and how we go about doing that. And our present policy language is um, not consistent with some of our neighboring towns, but could be broadened a little bit to recognize that. So I'll have some draft language for you to consider. And then the issue becomes, what would the beach sticker discount be, the dollar value percentage? So it's fully up for debate, but I think the, the uh, veteran raised a a very good issue. Um, we don't recognize right now by policy what's referred to as the DD-214 document, which is the official record of a service person's time in service. It talks about what their uh, military occupational specialty was, how many years they were in service, if they had se seen um, service in a, a war zone and whatnot. And um, so he presented that to our town clerk's office, and, and we didn't recognize that as a uh, document to prove military service. The other thing is, a driver's license with a veteran's stamp on it um, could also be recognized. So I'll have some language for you to consider for the next meeting. I think okay. that would be great. 
So the next meeting is the 18th. We're off on the 11th. Um, Tracy said the scholarships. Yeah, they have their baccalaureate. In. They have their baccalaureate night tonight, and it was originally scheduled for tonight. But seeing as the majority of our seniors attend that baccalaureate, they would have had to ch had chosen. So we thought it was best that we put it off. But um, another thing is, is Thursday they actually have their scholarship night at the high school, and we may want to consider participating in that at some point in time. Um, it's nice that they're here and they're recognized because the taxpayers uh, put in money and their taxes to do it, but it would be nice also when all the other kids are there getting their um, funds that perhaps we could participate in that too. So we've had a little bit of discussion amongst the, the committee, but unfortunately they couldn't be here tonight, so they, we asked to move it. The other item I wanted to share with you on the 18th, it'll come to you in a form of a memo. There's been quite a dialogue uh, up and down the Cape as it relates to summer preparations for uh, beach activities, if we will. So um, the working group that's been established by uh, towns that have uh, operate beaches, um, they have had a proposal to change some warning language uh, for some signage for uh, sharks, for lack of a better phrase. We've been inundated by media. Uh, inquiries as it relates to what the plan is so I wanted to share with you a memo that will go out to you in the next couple of days and then have it for a discussion topic so that you can uh, be briefed on what it is that the town staff is doing consistent with other town beach operators uh, on that particular topic and then all the other provisions that are going on for people's safety visiting our beaches. Will the Recreation Commission have an opportunity to chime in first? They kind of do the beaches, don't they? Uh, yes, yeah, so interestingly the Public Works is uh, uh, in charge of the beaches now with the with the rec uh, is in charge of the lifeguard aspect. So Carl Von Hohn, uh, Pat Armstrong and Jeff Colby, particularly Carl and Pat, have been integral as part of coming up with this integrated uh, <laughs> uh, position on this. And we'll certainly run that by the recs commission. But I, I, I think it's important before I answer or anybody on the board answers any uh, inquiry from the press that we have an opportunity to share with you what's what the town preparations have been on that particular topic. So th that's the beach sticker? No, that's discussion? the summer seasonal operational update, Mr. Okay. Welcome. All right. So does anyone have anything else on the uh, meeting of the 18th or, 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 or matters that they would like to see brought forward? I, I, I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. You don't mind if I have a turn to you? <laughs> 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 um, we've been... Uh, talking about parking at Bass Hole for quite some time and here we are on the on the verge of another summer season and have never found time to deal with it. Um, I think we need to talk about it and deal with it. I don't know what the delays are. Um, I've heard some discussions about conservation commissions and approval of um, putting hardener on the sides which is only going to encourage people to park. Um, there's a serious parking and safety issue down there, and I want to know what's being done to address it. Okay. <clears throat> so I would imagine you'd want this, that to come forward for fairly soon, given... Well, it's probably too late at this point anyway, but I, the sooner I, the better. I can have something available. We did have... Um, uh, activity by the Conservation Commission that did approve a shoulder uh, material. I'll have a briefing uh, for you. I'll put it in a memo form and we can have that dialogue. I, we are at the point now, the, um, the, the company VHB that was working on Center Street in Homer's Dock Road um, that had given a speed study activity on it. They're at a point they gave us a conceptual as to um, beach reconfiguration or beach parking reconfiguration inside the Bass Hole lot. I mean, we're all of the idea that once that uh, shoulder gets improved, if we don't do something, that's likely where the cars are going to end up going. So um, we wanted to bring that quickly to your attention, and, they're, um, and we're um, asking legal counsel if there's any, like, temporary uh, parking uh, regulation that without uh, to see, because what you want, don't want to do is pass a new parking regulation without knowing how it's going to work, but there might be a temporary regulation we can enact to keep people off the new shoulder. Uh, and then we do know that to do something more significant down in the parking lot, we're probably going to need some 
uh, appropriation of funds. I don't know what that looks like yet, but I'll certainly have Mr. Colby address that with you. It, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, the the issue with regard to parking on both sides of the road? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we've we've had a, a conversation. I mean, this involves roadways, so that's uh, t public works in the police department. Phil Magnuson has sent over to me, so he's been working on apparently some revisions on uh, no parking uh, regulations in the town. So this is something that is on the police department's radar screen, and and it's something that we'll take a look at, and and, and ultimately. I, I think it would be fair to say anywhere where that improved shoulder is, you definitely don't want to have any parking on that side of the road. Well, aside from the shoulder, uh, uh, can't something be done with regard to the parking regulations sooner than the shoulder uh, is, is we addressed? We could. If, if you um, would give me some recommendations, I'm glad to run that by Public Works to see what we can do. And, uh, you know, if there's a specific set of uh, no parking restrictions that we want to do there. I mean, we hear a lot of mixed commentary, we, you know, and from some of the residents we hear in the high point of the summer, you can't, you can't get down either side of the road because there's cars all over. You can't. So, right. Um, I, cars I leave can't it, pass right, right. On, a day, on a weekend in right. July. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a public safety issue. No question. Uh, I mean, that's really, uh, residents have raised that question repeatedly about the inability uh, they, they see an inability of um, public safety uh, to gain access to the beach, which, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm sure Phil could speak to the fact that we're called there uh, frequently yeah. uh, for a variety of issues. Uh, and, and um, you know, the, I, I think we need to do something before uh, the new season and uh, you know, what, however that has to be moved onto our agenda, I think is appropriate at yeah, this point. Yeah, we can point. have something for you to discuss on the 18th, but certainly if you've got some inputs you want to have us consider as to relates to the scope of what that should look like, well, we, we had can incorporate I think the, the, you know, I'll speak for myself, the, the only inputs I would have is that uh, you know, it doesn't work right now with parking on, on both, sides. both sides of the street. Right. Uh, and uh, it's, as, it's as straightforward as that as to whether as to which side should be, uh, should the no parking be on? Well, you know, if you if you look at the the last 200 feet uh, before you actually get into the parking lot at, at uh, Bass Hole, the the parking on the east side of the road uh, near where or that accesses the pavilion, um, we can't very well put no parking along there. Uh, so, you know, I think the other side of the road, the um, west side, seems to make, at least to me, and, and certainly if and anybody else is, can chime in on this, seems to me to make the most sense uh, in order to, uh, to avoid conflict. Um, you know, uh, whether we allow people to continue to park on uh, the east side is uh, you know probably a short-term situation because that, from what I understand at this point, is where the um, shoulder improvement will take place is on the east side. So long-term, that means that actually both sides will end up with no parking. One one side dedicated to the the uh, <coughs> pathway. <clears throat> and the other side with prohibition uh, for parking. So, I, and, you know, that, that may be appropriate. Uh, but, uh, but for now, I think at least uh, having no parking along that west side as, as a temporary solution would at least address the, uh, the, the public safety issues. I'll check with the director. I believe the uh, construction work on that, they were actually in the process of ordering materials. So I know that's kind of fast track to do that shoulder improvement. So I'll find out Ooh, when the construction schedule Did we schedules. even talk about a shoulder improvement? I don't remember having any conversation about the shoulder improvement. I'm just surprised we're at that point. We've been given updates about the fact that a shoulder improvement was going before the Conservation Commission on a couple of occasions. I don't remember it because yeah. I think we actually need to talk about stickering or allowing residents a resident, you know, resident sticker and, and, and making stickers down there because not only that, we have a lot of maintenance that has to be done. And I mean, I think we need a broader discussion is my point before we 
Yeah, you know, I, I, it's certainly a, a you know, bass hole is a complex situation, but uh, uh, and and you know, I've certainly heard residents <clears throat> asking for a quote unquote resident sticker to allow access to that area. However, um, it's not just the beach. Uh, the boardwalk is is a major consideration in that area, and I think. Eliminating, effectively eliminating the boardwalk as a uh, tourist destination by requiring a resident sticker would be a well, huge mistake. We could do mistake. both. People could get free resident stickers and then we could sell to anybody else who wants to visit. What's wrong with that? Good idea. Free resident, I don't understand. Well, we free have residence. resident stickers like Dennis Pond, we have the same problem. You have to have a resident sticker. You can get to go in and get a free resident sticker to park at Dennis Pond if you have children. We could do something like that at Gray's Beach for residents. You could get a free sticker, but anybody else would have to have a beach sticker or pay to park. I think we're inviting a nightmare uh, with that what kind of approach. What we have now is kind of a nightmare. Well, I think we ought to deal with the parking issue, frankly. Uh, but that would solve to, the parking uh, issue. Yeah. And not only that, what we're doing is, is putting a huge burden on our police officers to be down there enforcing it. They don't have time to do that, be at the beach all day long enforcing it. If we had, if we had a sticker person down there and that was generating fees to offset itself, at least we'd have somebody down there that would be able to monitor what was going on. And it's not for the lifeguard to do. I think, I think you have a range of... Uh, I'm not sure what to do with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, We've been at it since the day I arrived in town. The residents down there have talked about improving the um, pedestrian safety situation down there. It's clearly a, uh, not an ideal scenario. The parking issue has been kicked around quite a bit. The uh, idea of improving the shoulder so people are given a safe place to walk has been talked about since the very beginning. Oh, I thought you were talking about improving the shoulder for them to park there. Oh, no, it's that, for, it's for That's walking. what's oh. going to happen. No, They're going to park walking. there. Well, no, that's what my point is. Really for walking. We're going to improve it so you can safely walk on right. the side right. of the road, but people will see that as a place to yeah. park. No, right. you, have to, you have to post no parking on the improved side so right. people right. can walk on that. I don't know which side is being proposed to, for improvement. It would probably make sense that it would be the east side, right? I believe well, it's Well, that's what's being proposed, right? Yeah. Is there something I don't think that, is there a barrier between the... No. People are going to just park on it. Well, that's what I'm saying. So we or wanted we to get something no in front of you on that topic. Um, I'll police it myself. <laughs> you can have a full-time <laughs> job. But the sticker <laughs> debate is one worthy of a yeah. full board debate for sure, because I, uh, I hear it from the... There are some folks that want it resident only. There's a lot of folks who come by seasonally they want to go see the boardwalk i heard from the chamber about tourist bus coming down there yeah. and they pack it in you know it's just it's a tough issue no question about it and we don't have a, a any type of gate attendant activity going on there now so anything like that would be a, no, a no. new cost that we don't have any allocation for so we also have boat activity that's that, true um, well that's limited too because yeah, it needs to be issue. dredged you can barely get a kayak in and out of there <laughs> and compounded by a disappearing beach yeah, and yeah. we ha we need the money to, to fix it. That could be solved quickly, too. <laughs> we don't, I don't want to know your idea on that one. One night. <laughs> yeah, the ice has been doing a pretty good job. <laughs> 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 right, so anything midnight else on the agenda review? Um, I, have a I have just a couple of things. Go ahead. Um, Thinking about our wastewater and how far out it is, um, I know the last time we were close to a vote or coming up with a plan, we tried to um, assist people in a temporary fashion. I think one of the problems that we're having right now is there's a lot of people that are still very hesitant on upgrading their property. And we are a few years out. And I'm wondering if the board wants to have any discussion on what type of temporary solutions or intermediate upgrades or we could request um, for that to happen. I, I know a few people that are interested in upgrading and they're going to wait for sewer and I'm told it's five years. So they're going to sit on their property and do nothing for five years. Yes, can we afford to do that? What in the interim can we do to... Um, allow reinvestment without a full-fledged um, 
million dollar so on whatever it might cost I don't know what 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 we're allowed to do I know it's a DEP issue um, but I think it's worthy of this board having some conversation because we really could generate some income that would allow us to perhaps go a little faster in this so we're very stifled right now uh, the other thing is is I was at the cultural center uh, not that long ago for mid Cape uh, the mid Cape cultural event that they had um, and I think that the arts and culture in our community gets left behind because we don't have a staff person that is assigned to helping I know that the cultural centers uh, expressed a little bit of um, concern about some of their arts projects that have been kind of um, put in the back burner there's really nobody in the community in our town that's focused on the arts and culture and I think at some point in time we may want to have a conversation about if that's valuable enough to us to um, assign a staff member to be able to um, help uh, move these items along I know Karen does the best she can but she's got a lot on her plate and um, some of the arts projects that we had approved in the past year or so has not moved off the mark so just something that this board should be aware of and perhaps think about that's all um, yeah just a few items um, <coughs> I, I too would like to uh, echo Tracy's comments regarding wastewater clean water and the need to sort of uh, get updated I know there's been some discussion uh, in briefings with respect to cost recovery and how that plans shaping up I think hopefully soon we can get briefed on just where, where that is at this point so um, like Tracy I think that's a topic that we need to find room on our agenda relatively soon um, I also want to uh, join with the other members in congratulating both Tracy and Mike for their reelection um, and for everybody else that participated it's it's frustrating looking at the turnout when in fact local elections actually mean a lot in terms of the quality of people's lives so um, I don't know what the solution is to that but um, it, it was you know congratulations and um, uh, we've got a lot of work to do um, also kudos to the town on the green communities designation that we got um, I just wanted to point out that um, I, I I know generally the work of the Cape Light Compact is, has been very helpful in moving that forward. So I just want to give a shout out to Maggie Downey and uh, Margaret Song for their help in, in supporting that effort. Um, you know, sometimes when you look at the photo ops, you know, um, I, I don't want to have a dig at anybody, but sometimes the people that have actually provided a lot of help, um, you know, sometimes miss out on those opportunities. And I think it's important for people to be aware that the Cape Light Compact provides a real service not just to the Cape but also to the to the town of Yarmouth and I want to just give a shout out to them um, as we all know Chris Dwelly has um, indicated that he has uh, future plans and um, I think now is the time to start lining up all our Chris Dwelly projects before he goes <laughs> so I the think Alan this Parsons <laughs> project <laughs> Yeah, so um, I know the words out there. I know that you're making plans. Chris, congratulations to you. Um, I know we're still gonna have more time together. I know you're not leaving tomorrow, but um, the word is out there. I think you've been a terrific assistant. And uh, I think Dover is gain is certainly our loss, but I know you have a great career ahead of you and I know you'll do great things there. So I just had to get that off my chest. So congratulations to you. And the, um, I attended the Route 6A corridor study meeting at the Congregational Church about a week or so ago. That place was packed. And I thought the dialogue, I thought the town did a great job in running it. Uh, we had uh, our consultants there, and uh, we had a lot of input and feedback on that. Um, I think the challenge is going to be finding consensus in terms of what to do and when to do it. But uh, uh, just kudos to Karen and Kathy and the town staff for organizing that and pulling that together, pulling that off, I thought they did a great job. And f finally, the um, in the beginning of this meeting when we did the public comments, um, I think one of the things that we should consider doing 
is either stating or offering at least some expression or something in writing about our policy in terms of how we handle public comments? Because uh, sometimes people don't really follow our meetings and they're not necessarily aware that during public comments it's not really an opportunity for deliberation on a particular topic. I know in some towns they actually make that statement in the very beginning. The select boards will make the statement in the very beginning of the meeting and before the agenda item comes up that under public comments they have three minutes that under the open meeting rules that we really cannot deliberate or talk to you and engage in a robust discussion about the topic. Um, but I think to some degree you could sense that people were a little bit frustrated that they, w they wanted to engage in the dialogue but they felt that they were somewhat hamstrung and I think some way, I know other towns literally will, other select boards will actually draft the policy, they'll briefly reference it in the beginning of that section and then have it written out available to people if they wanted to read it. Because um, I think some folks left the meeting with the misperception that we weren't particularly interested in the topic and that we were being somewhat, we were disengaging in some way and I don't, I don't think that's a reflection of this board at all um, and I don't think people should uh, leave with a misunderstanding on that. I think we need to be, we should consider being a little bit more open about how we handle uh, those public comments and like I said there may be some value in even having a copy of the law or the policy if we have one but something that just sort of explains to people that that's not the time to deliberate and discuss a pretty hot topic. I mean, if you put that on the agenda, invited public discussion, I mean, that could have gone on for an hour at least. More than that. Even well, more. Yeah. And um, so Tracy, I doesn't the school committee read a short statement before they have public comment? Yes. And, and say what the limitations are. I, I think that's probably a good idea. But I think there's, um, I would say, I know we're going to use the word rare, but very limited circumstances under which the board might want to respond. For example, if somebody in public comment is just making blatant misstatements about mm -hmm. the board's policies or feelings, I think the board may feel compelled at that point to set the record straight so that that misinformation doesn't continue. Mm -hmm. Because there's enough misinformation out there as it is, especially in my opinion about this school situation. I'm not going to get in, into any details about that for obvious reasons, but I've been on this board not as long as some of you, but six years now, and I can't think of an issue, honestly, when I engage people about it where there's so much lack of understanding and, and misunderstanding about what our board's position is or isn't or what we did or didn't do or what is or isn't at stake uh, with this litigation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know we've had uh, many meetings where we've spoken out about this, um, many meetings far in advance of the December 4th election. Um, but I don't think people follow all these meetings. And they get a little bit here and a little bit there, and they might read a newspaper article or two, they might read a few things on Facebook and try to piece it all together. and, and um, this stuff is pretty complex and pretty involved and you have to stay with it. I find if, if I'm trying to explain everything from the beginning to the end to people, it takes roughly about a half an hour to fill somebody in. I mean, it's, it's not something you can answer in a minute or two minutes. And back to uh, Mark's point, um, in, in a format like public comment, you're never going to be able to satisfy the people with all the questions they raise, you're not going to have the time to respond to all of that. No, but I think it's a matter of policy. Under I, maybe, maybe I'm mis misinformed here, but I think generally under the open meeting law, if something w warrants that kind of discussion, it should be an, agenda, be an, item, agenda, an sure. agenda item for a future meeting. Sure. So that's I. I just saw the look on a few fa the faces of some of the people that left, and for some reason. They shouldn't for a minute think that when they left that you don't care or we're not particularly interested in what they have to say. But right. we need to explain to them that we can't engage in that kind of dialogue and it should be supported as a policy so that it's something that can easily be handed out or disseminated. At, so at one point during one of my years as chairman, Mark, we, we had a statement right on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I thought it was there, actually. It's um, not anymore. It's not anymore. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know what happened yeah. to it. I don't yeah. know when it left. Yeah. Um, we should find it and put it back. Yeah. Oh. We should put it back. Yeah, I, I, Eric, I think it, it's a One of the other things that should be put back on here is at one point in time, I think we used to say that the times were 
approximate. Approximate yes. and can be changed. People come and they think it's, you know, oh, it right. says 715, but we have mm -hmm. the ability to change it. This is just a, an outline. Did we, we transition from agenda yeah, I items ask, to individual are items? We on an individual I'm sorry. Uh, Mark, 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 <laughs> has tra Mark has transitioned us a long time right. ago. Because I, oh, really? I, I wouldn't have known except it's on the and, TV. And his authority as vice chairman. Uh, can, can I make a few Abuse of power. <laughs> sorry, I'm the one you got to worry about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do have a couple of things. Um, yeah, I think we're, and unless anyone else has that, I'll back up on agenda if you have something, but otherwise. Well, I said my agenda items, but I do have individual items. Oh, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Uh, Eric has some, too. Oh, no, after you. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank the voters. Um, it's an honor to sit here. We certainly have work to do, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, not only do I have to thank the voters, I have to thank the board. Um, and I have to thank my husband, who uh, consistently is a supporter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Chris. Chris, I know you're going to be here for a while, um, and I appreciate that. I guess as a board, though, I think that we need to have some type of conversation, and I know it's Dan's appointment, um, but I feel pretty strongly that um, perhaps we should have somebody that has um, had experience and I only say that because, um, and this is no disrespect to Chris, because Chris has done a great job, but I guess I'm a little nervous not knowing what Dan's contract holds, what his commitment to our community is long-term, and I think we need to be prepared um, for succession. Uh, perhaps we can have a conversation with Dan about what his plan is and what our plan is with Dan, but um, at this point in time, I'm a little, I guess, nervous um, so I'm going to go on the record in saying that I would hope that, you know, obviously, like I said, it's Dan's, Dan's appointment, but I would hope that uh, he would pick somebody that has uh, experience. The other thing I'd like to say is I want to congratulate all the DY um, graduates. They graduate this Saturday. Um, it's usually nice to have them in for the scholarships right before the graduation. It's always a wonderful day. I always pray that everybody makes it there safely. I know um, it's great that Chris is having the, is hosting the, um, the party this year. Some of the prom parties have gone away, I guess, um, but we've already passed, passed prom and everybody made it safely, but it's always a day that makes you very nervous. So I'm very excited for all the graduates um, on Saturday. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Eric? Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to address Chris. He's dead to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, I just wanted to say, uh, obviously, um, Chris, you will be missed. You've done a great job since you've been here. Um, and I, I wish you much luck. I understand why you've made the move. I know that uh, having a, a child kind of changes your perspective and, and changes. Um, it, it certainly makes a short commute more desirable. It also makes more money more desirable, too. So, um, And I also want to thank um, or congratulate Mike and Tracy and offer the observation that um, you both won by pretty heavy margins. And I think the fact that um, the two of you are still sitting in those two seats is an indication, at least to me, that uh, a, a, a great percentage of the population of the voters in this town agree with what we're doing, all things. So um, some, some people probably don't share that sentiment, but judging by the numbers you won by, I think it's pretty clear, even to short-sighted and small-minded people like us. So congratulations. Thank you. Oh, and I'd like a splash pad before my term ends. I just <laughs> put that out there in case it ever gets. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll add my thoughts to Chris as well. I, I, I think uh, you've brought uh, uh, a lot of energy to, the, to your position and a lot of uh, new insights that have been very beneficial to our town and, and to the direction we're taking. And, and a lot that uh, um, I think you've served us well. And I, I think we're at a, uh, it's a real loss to our organization, but, but I think um, we have a great future with uh, a new town and uh, 
new things ahead of you, so congratulations. And a two-town school district. <laughs> and, uh, He's already <laughs> been there, done that. Right? Right? If, you can <laughs> if you learn anything and you'd like to share, you please give us a Sue call. Sue everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think we do have to have a discussion uh, with Dan uh, about uh, the the uh, type of person and and so forth to, to look for. Um, I'm I'm not necessarily sure that I I share some of uh, Tracy's. Uh, initial comments I think that's what discussion is for when we have that dis discussion so I won't go into any details at this point okay good mark I've said my piece <laughs> thank you thank you I took advantage of my spot. okay thank you because if you had anything further you were not going to be able to <laughs> go more than about 10 seconds okay. all right. <laughs> I um, a few items um, first of all um, congratulations Tracy um, on being reelected, I, wa I want to thank the voters too for electing electing me and the people who uh, supported me and um, worked for me and let me put signs on their property. Um, without all of that, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be reelected. So I am grateful to everyone. Um, Chris, when I read your email that you were leaving, it was not a it was not a good day for me, but. Um, but I fully understood why, and, and I think that, as I think I said in a brief reply to you, that you have to make the best decision you, for your family. That's what it's all about, and I'm sure that's what motivated um, your decision. But um, you've done great work for the town. You're a tremendous asset to the town. You had a, a brilliant future with this town that were you to stay, I think. Um, and, and I wish you the very best um, in Dover. Um, like Tracy, I, I wish to extend my congratulations to all of the young people in the community who will be graduating on Saturday. A um, couple items. Um, the day after the election, um, I attended a um, memorial service that the fire department had across the street to honor those who had passed away, um, who had served um, in, in, in the department during the past year. Um, very, very nice service, um, pretty well attended. I think Dan, Dan was there as well. Um, the other um, memorial type service that, that I went to was the Friday before uh, Memorial Day. They um, <coughs> honored Les Campbell who was a longtime uh, native of Yarmouth, former state police officer, former United States Marine. He was a town constable. He was a justice of the peace. He was a real estate broker, a real renaissance man and a stand-up comedian. Great, great guy. They, they, on the corner of Pine Grove Road and Route 28, they put a memorial there. Um, and, and I forget the exact inscription, but it's dedicated to his service as a United States Marine. Um, and Tim Whelan um, was there and, and did the dedication, and as usual, he did a very nice job. Um, so that was good, and uh, that's all I have for now. And Maureen, I forgot to thank Maureen. Oh yeah, and Maureen uh, did a great, um, as, uh, Maureen Tui Bedford, who I think most people know and should know, <laughs> puts on the Memorial Day service at Town Hall and uh, she did it once again, and it was another great, uh, in fact, I think it was the best one since I've been going. It gets better and better. She did a great job. And her guest speaker was fa fabulous, I thought. So, anything else? No. I think it was helpful that we had good sound. We could actually hear the sound. Well, it did make a couple. It was good. Uh, it did go off a couple times. I could hear Phil Morris's poem. Yes. For the first time. Yes. Yes, and Phil was here earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it did screech a couple times. But. We're working on that. At least, at least you could hear we it from could hear, 28. We heard it, yeah. All right, so let's move along to town administrator's items. Start with the consent agenda. Yes, uh, Mr. New Chairman, uh, on the consent agenda. Let's get the new. You can <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to know that out there. Is, uh, there's a revised charge for the Library Planning Committee. Uh, Jane Kane is here in the uh, audience. Uh, we're excited about getting that project, uh, that effort underway. 
and also uh, some donations and gifts uh, are also on the consent agenda. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to move the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, town administrator updates. Yes, sir. Um, we did uh, have the Green Communities team from Boston and Commissioner Judson here. I'm very pleased to announce that we did get authorization to begin our effort. So um, thankfully for us, uh, included in that effort uh, due to some past town articles includes uh, vehicles, electric vehicles, because our town hall fleet is in, in a significant state of uh, disrepair right now. So we're looking forward to getting some charging stations built and moving towards that and uh, getting a lot of our upgrades underway so that we had a great turnout um, and to Selectman Forest Point we could not have done it without Margaret Song particularly at the Cape Light Compact she does incredible work and in fact not just for us but for all the towns on the Cape um, and she has uh, also continued there's some additional grant money coming to the town as it relates to technical assistance with some of these efforts related to green community so we're very pleased about that so they do a great job uh, I was uh, pleased to be invited as a number of town staff were to have a listening session with Lieutenant Governor today and uh, Secretary of uh, Housing and Economic Development Keneally up in Chatham. Uh, I would say uh, amongst uh, the recipient or the uh, participants of the Cape, uh, Selectman Forrest was there. There was probably uh, about 120 people there or thereabouts. Yep. Uh, I would say the common themes were uh, job creation, innovation, uh, housing options, and uh, uh, broadband access for residents on the Cape. Um, I am also pleased to report that we had a secondary follow-up session, uh, a few of us with the secretary uh, a little bit later on to better focus in on those topics and how might the secretary's programs that they have in Boston benefit the Cape Town. So uh, Yarmouth was well represented uh, and it was, um, we're looking forward to following up with the Lieutenant Governor on many of these suggestions to uh, advance the Cape's agenda on, that, on those three particular topics. <coughs> Parker's River Bridge, um, we, as you know, uh, we had uh, um, a couple things we had to dot the I's on across the T, though it hasn't happened yet. Uh, if everything stays on track, by the next meeting that we have, uh, the advertisement package will be out to bid, hopefully, at that point. So that is a massive undertaking. Uh, Kathy Williams and Jeff Colby and now Amanda Ruggiero have uh, joined uh, the effort to do this. This is no small feat to do a bridge, uh, town-led, state-related bridge. And, uh, and I think uh, um, I can't say enough that uh, what that means to that area of town for sure for the future. It's got a lot of benefit to us. Also, uh, as it relates to uh, other regional collaboratives, uh, the DHY group is probably going to ask for a three-town meeting. It's looking like sometime in the fall. Um, I don't think at this point there'll be any support to put any request for project dollars on uh, a, a fall town meeting. We're looking to have simply the agreement language that the DHY team has worked on uh, be in front of the uh, town meeting in the fall with the idea that we would have uh, an ask maybe in the spring of 20, 20 uh, for the first round of construction uh, dollars associated with that and uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, the efforts of Dick Court and the DPW uh, we reached a milestone the other day if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it but the police uh, repair garage uh, has been completely vacated and cleaned out the new mechanic will start in a couple of weeks housed in a what I would call a state-of-the-art makeshift facility at the water department garage it'll be much safer for uh, the mechanic uh, and also a much better working environment so um, that was a very large lift on uh, Mr. Court's behalf to get that done so what will happen with the vacant building yeah so my understanding is and perhaps Eric you can fill me in on this I, I believe that building is in tough condition but th that building and the other ancillary uh, support sheds will be uh, removed as part of the DPW garage. Is that, is that the is that the larger building? The, this is the building, so it's, uh, as it's you're looking you go around Road. the back side of it's it, it's, it's kind of a small building. It's like a garage service station. Like an yeah, old everything garage. is slated to be removed it, with yeah. the exception of the main build, the current main yeah, building. Yeah, main, current main building. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. So um, I think for now, what 
DPW will do is or they'll, they'll have parks use it for cold storage until that point comes lawn mowers and whatnot it it, uh, it cleaned up nice is what I could say but it is structurally problematic for sure but um, but that's kind of the plan on that site to uh, with the new facility so why, why you're on the subject of yes, court I've seen the work that they've done down here oh, it's, uh, fabulous. renovating yeah. these office spaces they've done an incredible job yeah. Yeah. I mean they're very usable they're very people friendly and you notice right off the bat that staff are very happy folks that are working in these offices it's a very pleasant work environment so thank you for kudos, kudos to him and the rest of the team for, for doing that you guys have done a great job it was um, our objective to utilize fully utilize space in the building and I and I am pleased to note that around the corner there conference room B is now open for business it needs a little bit of cosmetic work but we can now use that and then eventually we'll come next winter season we'll start working on C and then we have to do some work upstairs on the on the second floor um, to finish it off but uh, you're right uh, the, the staff was uh, integral as part of this activity it was no shortage of uh, if we had before pictures it was quite a beholden uh, transformation that's occurred but they are beautiful office spaces done within budget mr. court does a fabulous job uh, and he's done a, his team has done it you know like yeah. I, said, I can't speak enough about how good they are so yeah, that's great and other than that I'm I'm done mr. chairman okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I could just have a moment, just sure. Since I became a we can have all the time you want, Chris. Oh, just because you're a topic, an agenda oh, you topic want to speak? this evening. Um, I just want to, you know, for the record, uh, thank this entire board. Uh, certainly, Dan uh, and the full team here in Yarmouth. It's been a uh, a fabulous two years, and truthfully, one of the most difficult decisions uh, that I that I had to make. Um, you've been very good to me. This town has been very good to me, and I hope. Uh, I will be here for some time, but I hope that when I do leave, I've left uh, some small mark and have made some commitment, some small improvement to the town. So I just, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for uh, for everything you've done for me and the opportunity that you've provided me these past few years. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. Wait a minute. Uh, no, no, a question for Dan. Yes, sir. You do? Um, yeah. Okay. On the um, uh, agreement, uh, is there Wait, been agreement? Uh, no. Uh, oh, oh uh, yes. Then, then it's here the agreement. Yes. Um, we had some discussion about uh, the Department of Education and Secondary, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education. Thank you for bringing that uh, to my attention. So uh, we've been asked to send uh, up to two Board of Selectmen delegates to a meeting with two uh, counterparts from Dennis to DESC, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Office in Malden uh, for June 13th. If um, anybody on the board would like to uh, volunteer for that, I don't know uh, how long of service that would entail, but at least a trip for now uh, to, to Malden on the 13th. I'd be happy to go. That we not go. About a tent. I think it's a complete waste of time shoved down our throat by someone who wasn't interested in helping us before this failed in Dennis. Hmm. Um, I, um, I think it's far too important to not at least, I don't know what th the agenda is. We, we have no idea what the goal is but um, I think it's far too important to not at least listen to what they're trying to offer and you know whoever does it and I'd be willing to go if the if the board wants but uh, I really just want to know what their plan is I want to know what, what what the goal is what we're trying to achieve and, and I think that if we come back and we share with the board and it's not something that we want to participate in I, but at this point in time I think we should listen do I think you want to know what the goal was before yeah you but I didn't schedule it I don't I don't I don't know any of the background behind it exactly. I think somebody's trying to help the whole process what's the what's motivation what's the process what's the end result you have no answers you're walking into a meeting blind with no hopes of a you know a positive outcome well I have hopes of a positive outcome I don't I agree that we don't know I don't think the parameters have been set fairly 
I don't think giving us, you know, limited amount of time to respond or even know what the goal is, I, I don't know any of that information, but I think that from my perspective, the, I mean, it would, would be a lot of people have urged us to have mediation. Um, so I think it would be hard for us not to at least attempt it. I think the problem is that ultimately, regardless, it needs to pass and Dennis. And I'm not sure. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what the goal is. I think we have to go and listen. Is my point. Before we go to you, Norm, and and I want to go to you. Trust me, Mark. Do you do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I. I feel v uh, my concerns are very similar to Eric's in that I think we're entitled to know what this is all about, what the purpose is, the goal is, what the expectations are. Um, and that's, that's something that I, I, I have a problem with. On the other hand, I understand where Tracy's coming from. I think Tracy's points are, are well taken. Um, if this meeting in a broad sense can be construed as finding a way to achieve consensus, mediating, resolving differences, then um, I think there may be value in that. But the thing, the thing is, is that there is an agreement on the table. The school committee has an agreement. They have a proposal. Um, that's the agreement that I believe the state should be facilitating support for. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me is what I would expect, or at least like some confirmation on um, with respect to any kind of meeting like this. The whole idea of starting from square one, starting over, I think, I think that's a huge mistake. So um, I, think, I think it's good that Tracy's offered to, to go because of her role on this board being our DY liaison. I think, I think perhaps that would be, a, a, to the extent that the board wants to have presence there, I think, I think that would be fine. But I'm a little bit concerned about how our not our lack of presence could be interpreted as well. Yeah, that could create a real problem. I want to go to Norm. Yeah, I, you know, I share some hesitancy on, on this thing, uh, uh, but um, you know, regardless of how suspicious we might be of motivations, I th I think the issue is, um, yeah, we we really need to talk with the people across the table one way or the other and, and uh, in, you know uh, I, I don't see that kind of discussion coming about um, fruitfully uh, at this stage uh, from from uh, any of the parties in Dennis right now and I'm not being critical of them I'm just saying they they just don't seem to have any motivation to do that um, you know, the, the re, uh, rejection of the proposals that, uh, uh, of the proposed agreement uh, by the town of Dennis. Um, by the school committee. Uh, right, the proposals by the school committee indicate uh, uh, support for um, what was said by uh, some of their select board manor, members and, and finance committee members in which uh, they said uh, they they thought that the requests were um, for a change in the agreement as to the uh, percentages of sharing were um, unreasonable. So at this point, the interpretation would be that they'd be looking for those to be, those uh, proposals to be reduced or eliminated and I think that um, uh, while the uh, school committee proposal uh, was clear, what it what it did was simply lay out percentages. It uh, did not come with any rationale mm. or support for why those requests were being made. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was extensive negotiation that Mike, you participated in with, with me, with uh, the, the town of Dennis, in which we laid out uh, the rationale behind our requests uh, for changes in the agreement at, at some great length. 
and um, that all of that was was really lost mm -hmm. in the proposal that uh, the school committee made and 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 very frankly I don't think the school committee um, made a major effort to uh, support their their proposal with uh, with either town mm -hmm. and I think that that was very unfortunate uh, and and um, you know, I won't say that that was the sole factor leading to its defeat but I think that it, it certainly contributed to the defeat so um, uh, do I hold great hopes for uh, a mediation effort? Um, well, I, I've had my hopes uh, dashed many times uh, already over the last year uh, in this negotiation process. Uh, but, I, but I think we need to lay out our uh, case very clearly um, and the rationale uh, behind our requests and um, be sure that um, uh, if someone is mediating, they understand fully why we're asking for what we're asking. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, uh, that's very important at this stage. I, I think, um, you know, to, I think it would mis be a mistake to go in with simply say, well, we have, a, we have an agreement that the school committee endorsed and, and uh, we think that's what should be accepted. I, I, I don't think that does justice to uh, what we tried to, to uh, accomplish over the last year. Can so, I? You know, I'd, I'd be happy to attend the meeting. I'd, you know. let, me, let me just make a few comments and then I'll come back, Tracy. Um, I mean, the public's going to want to hear that we're willing to sit down and, and try to work out our differences um, with a mediator. Um, and, and, and that probably will, will would benefit public perception. But um, in the last analysis, whatever is done, even if the, quote, ideal agreement were to be reached, it has to go through the school committee and it has to be passed by both town meetings. The latest proposal that was made by the school committee, which I believe was going to um, contain a 65-35 um, split on the school with Yarmouth paying 65%. And um, I think it also had, um, it was going to adopt the foundation enrollment, wasn't it, going Correct. forward on operational yes, costs. Right. Um, that, that proposal met overwhelming support at Yarmouth Town Meeting, and I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it was defeated by a 60-40 vote in the town of Dennis. So I think what's important, back to Eric's point, for people to realize is there's, there's no magic wand that can be waved to, to effectuate some kind of solution to this agreement, short of in the last analysis, both towns, um, both town meetings accepting whatever changes there are. And Dennis, based on the most recent vote, has shown an unwillingness to make those changes. So, um, you know, I, uh, I have no problem sending a, a, a couple of our selectmen up there, but, um, I think whatever's done, once it hits Dennis Town Meeting and it's going to cost them more money than it's costing them now, we're going to run into unbelievable resistance. That's what I've learned so far about this process. Tracy? Well, but that, that's to Norm's point. That's what I, exactly what I wanted to touch on, I think, because the people of Yarmouth did vote for it. Um, and I, I, don't f I feel like the conversation got sidetracked and the education of really what those numbers meant did not happen. And if there's one ask that I would ask while I'm there is for an independent person. Of course, when it comes from us, you know, I, I talked to Cheryl last night. The point is they're protecting their taxpayers, we protect our taxpayers. Carol and the school committee, I think, 
had to take those numbers because what the conversation I hear now is, oh, we're, we're back to splitting administrative costs, which is virtually the same thing that we had. But it needs to be an independent person that doesn't have a vested interest to look at it and, and really educate the, the public about what other communities do and the fairness of how they feel the fairness of that proposal is. My concern is I don't like going to Malden behind closed doors and having that. If it's a first kickoff meeting, then that's one thing. But I think that we need to stress that they need to take a look at what the proposal was and see if they can help us break it down in terms of the fairness and helping us educate the public. Maybe we're off base. Maybe we, maybe we are. If it takes somebody from the outside to tell us that, then that's what we need to hear. But if we're not off base, and the proposal in their mind is fair, I think that we could utilize their help in, in getting them to put those numbers from the outside to say, you know, it really could be this number. It could be this number. But, you know, this is, this is far below that. And, and it needs to come from somebody else. Back to Norm's point, and I, I, I want to provide a little bit of um, clarity to it because I think it was a really good point. When we were negotiating with Dennis, um, and, and we had our negotiating group, the two finance committee members from each town, the two selectmen, one school committee member, and all the support personnel from both town staffs. Um, one of the things we, we had agreed to in the course of the negotiating session was to split certain administrative costs, mm -hmm. which amounted to, I believe, Norm, the number was about $2.9 million. Correct. Yep. Those costs were identified by Carol Woodbury in working in conjunction with um, Rich Bienvenu. And that wasn't all of the fixed costs, but those were the only ones Dennis would agree to. There were others like utilities, and we, we never got to that. We never got any agreement on that. But we did agree on those that $2.9 million worth of fixed administrative costs. It didn't bear any relationship to the relative student populations of each town. If Dennis had their own school, they'd have those costs. If Yarmouth had their own school, they would have those costs. And I think what happened when the school committee started drafting their own version of things, they tried to translate that into just raw percentages <coughs> and say, okay, if we do a five-year phase-in um, from 30% to 35%, that that would be the uh, you know kind of an approximation as to what was agreed to with respect to the fixed administrative costs but i think it had um a negative effect with a lot of people because they they looked at mm -hmm. the percentages as pretty existing agreement which were somewhere around 30 or maybe a little more a little less and they said well if we have 30 percent of the students why should we be paying 35 percent of the expenses and that kind of backfired I, th I think uh, just just and, and I'm, their motivations were to simplify things, yeah. and, and, but but I think what it then appeared to be was simply a money grab. Yes. And in, instead of here's the the economic reality of operating this school district, and here are the the expenses that should be shared equally between the mm -hmm. two committees. Never heard that. And we never heard that. Never uh, heard that. And, and, and that it translated was, basically. Uh, I know Brian Sullivan had done the done the math. Right. But but that list of things was never presented to the voters in, no. in Dennis, so it it made it appear that, you know, well the conversation was that they were supplementing us, and that in fact right. is not the truth. And, 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 and nobody got to rebut that, and nobody got right. to have a real conversation about what those numbers are. But if somebody from the outside can look at all those numbers, it's way more than 2.9 million. Mm -hmm. that, the 2.9 oh, million yes. didn't even take into effect no. OPEB, did it? It did not, and so, it also did not take so into account the principals' we already salaries heard and their staff. Tonight, that right. at one point in time, 42 percent of the students. Right. So now, 12 percent of those retirees' benefits are paid by Yarmouth. That should be exactly all, right. that should be all part of the conversation. Yes. That I feel like needs to come from somebody who looks at these all over the state and says, you know what, this is a fair deal. Yeah. So I, I I don't know. I you know I. It's a, it's a frustrating situation. I, I, I do think, and, and you know, Eric brought this up a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we had, we don't have it on our agenda, so it, I think it should appear on our agenda. 
is, I think, on a parallel basis, we as a board need to be considering what our alternative should be moving forward. I don't think we should wait for, for no. this meeting to conclude. I think that, that Eric's point about, you know, we need to, to start working on our own plan uh, moving forward and that uh, is did we get looks any, at all the options. Did we get any feedback on that, Dan, about what our authority is? I know you were going to. I'm working with Jay now on a leasing situation. We've done some research on that. I'm hoping to have an answer by the 18th when we sit down with him again. But certainly, if you wanted to put an agenda item on on the 18th or the next possible meeting to authorize me to go down, I mean, it could be the, to start the process would be we have an on-call architects and engineers list to solicit uh, uh, cost proposals for a fees our own town-generated feasibility analysis of retaining both of those. Uh, buildings. There's enough like public documents that are out there that have been generated that have already been publicly paid for that it wouldn't like be reinventing the wheel, but at least give you an idea. I mean, to the point of, hey, $40 million, which is less than what we'd be in on this school, goes a long way to repairing two other b buildings. And if that's something you want to do, and, and maybe that becomes part of a discussion as to is it worth, uh, you know, going alone. But it starts with what's in front of us as it relates to the quality and integrity of those building envelopes and the experience inside it. So I think our share is actually like f between 50 and 51, somewhere around 51 million dollars, isn't it? With the uh, 73. Oh, the 73. Uh, yeah, because we'd be getting 70 percent plus 70, of that amount right. of money. That's right. So That's we'd right. be over 50 million. Yep. And that would be the number yep. we'd have. Dan, has there ever been a scenario where the MSBA has gotten this far down the road on a joint project and has considered? An, uh, uh, an alternate option for reimbursement? I'm not aware of that. I am aware of at least one uh, district's situation that they could never get the project over the finish line um, through town meeting votes and subsequent as after they reconfigured uh, they put a, a new proposal effort went through the uh, statement of interest process which is very tedious and long to restart it in um, and even in Westfield, where I left, they uh, after since 2009 they reauthorized a new SOI for another elementary school project, but you have to kill or whatever's in front of them now has to be completely at the end point, and then retired, and then you can reapply again. So to say that they wouldn't look at something different, I would never speak for them, but it's it's really local determination. What what is it that you'd like us to consider? file one of these forms in January and you'll go in the queue you know so well we know what the original consideration was is there my point is is there a way for us to request the school committee to go back to that yeah, not, so so right now because they went down this road on the SOI and then there was some project <coughs> scope creep that happened we're at that point this project would have to be finished and be declared done before they would uh, consider pulling out and doing something different we've gone down a deep road on this project and if you recall, when this process first started, before Carol ever slipped Wixen into the equation, I wanted to go back to DESC and ask for permission to do Mattakees and Emmy Small. It was impossible. They won't do it. We'll lose all the funding, blah, blah, blah. Bunch of crap. Somehow Wixen got slipped in, but we can't slip in Emmy Small. You know, they concocted an education plan that suited their needs and made it more viable to include Wixen. They should have concocted an education plan that made it more viable to include Emmy Small. But, you know, we're, we've, we've just gone back, the discussion we're having right now, we've just gone back in time, two years. But let's go spend some more time with a mediator. Well, you're not going to do that. I certainly, I'll go. You don't want me to go. I'd rather ha I'd rather DESE supply us with a with a somebody that's going to consult us on deregionalization. That's a worthwhile discussion. I think that's part of the discussion we have to have ultimately uh, a couple of weeks from now. But uh, you know, that's uh, it's all part of the picture. So right now, Norm and Tracy are volunteering to go. No one else interested? No. Okay. Then, uh, 
Go with my blessings. <laughs> Godspeed. Say? Yeah. Godspeed. Yeah. Godspeed and may God have mercy on your souls. <laughs> well, we hope we come back with some, some good news. We got work to do. I mean, right. it doesn't preclude us from looking at alternatives in the interim. And I, and I still feel strongly that at some point in time, we need to hear from the public. We need to hear from them about what direction they want us to take. I think that that's extremely important. I know I've heard from people individually, but I think collectively in the public, I think it would be nice to have some type of public forum that says, here we are. Where do you want us to go from here? Before we adjourn, uh, before we adjourn, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make one uh, little announcement that we, we overlooked. Um, the South Yarmouth Library is having TikTok with Larry Dapsis on Saturday, June 8th, 10 a.m. So if you're interested in knowing what's happening or how to protect yourselves uh, from ticks, um, Larry Dapsis will be in town at the South Yarmouth Library on Saturday, June 8th at 10 a.m. That's great. He's terrific. He knows his yes. stuff. And we have a very high percentage and a lot of Lyme's issues here, so exactly. protecting yourself is important. Are you ready for a motion? I am. Uh, I move to adjourn. Second. We have All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs>